it will be posted on our website, um, e3.peakstoprairies.org. And you'll see that website a number of different times throughout this presentation. But it will be recorded and placed there probably by the end of the week. Um, now I would like to go ahead and introduce Matt Bogosian. Um, again, he's the Senior Policy Advisor at EPA and a really strong force behind the success of the E3 initiative. So go ahead, Matt. Great. Thanks, Myla, and uh, welcome uh, to everyone listening in. Um, I am in Washington, D.C., and it's sunny here. <laughs> and um, so we feel lucky uh, for that. And um, we're going to be talking about um, E3, which uh, stands for Economy, Energy, and the Environment. And I just want to open it up, um, uh, and we're going to you know, have experts and practitioners um, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk more about the details and what it might mean for Montana. So, just a just a quick um, uh, snapshot of what uh, what E3 is all about. It's you know, I heard somebody say uh, once it's it's a uh, a ten year overnight success. Um, so basically, uh, where E3 began was um, with a unique partnership between the Department of Commerce has its uh, uh, National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. Uh, they have a um, decentralized system like a lot of uh, federal agencies. And, and uh, they have a, a system called uh, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership System, called uh, MEP for short. Of course, feds always have these acronyms. And they have offices around uh, in each American state. And their job has been historically to, to help manufacturers be more efficient in, in lean manufacturing and, and those kinds of things. Well, about 10 years ago, um, some of our uh, EPA folks uh, had uh, it, it engagement with the, the Department of Commerce and this MEP folks and say, hey, you know, there's some, some uh, environmental things uh, that uh, tools and best practices that you might want to look at as well to help uh, the universe of 300,000 small and medium-sized American manufacturers kind of tune up their operations. And so they began this partnership and developed a, a program called uh, for big companies called the Green Suppliers Network that helped to, you know uh, improve supply chains in small towns and communities around um, the country that were suppliers to these larger companies. So um, over time, communities started to, to come at, at the federal government saying, hey, you're doing this thing for big companies in this green suppliers network. Why can't you, why can't you do it for communities as a whole? And so this is the beginning of a kind of a trend toward trying to develop place-based initiatives around the country uh, to, to help job creation and, uh, and to help uh, companies make money, uh, you know, to, and, to also mitigate environmental pollution, kind of the triple bottom line there. Um, so a unique partnership uh, began with not just um, the Department of Commerce and EPA, but adding on other federal agencies that might help communities in the kind of the grander uh, economic development ecosystem, help communities help their manufacturers uh, and support networks uh, wherever they might exist. Um, and so that began this six-agency partnership uh, called E3, Economy, Energy, and the Environment. And so that's the Department of Commerce, as I described, um, EPA, but also includes um, the Small Business Administration to give advice and loans where it makes sense, the Department of Labor uh, to, to help on the workforce training piece, um, and, um, and uh, then um, we also included the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, uh, I'm missing one agency, and I'm I'm sorry I can't recall it right now off the top of my head. Um, Did you but, say SBA, uh, Matt? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, SBA. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, Myla. Yeah, SBA was one of the original five. So the original five: EPA, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor, um, and SBA. Um, Department, of, and, Department of Energy is the other one, Matt. And I'm sorry, thank you. That was the one I was missing. Mm -hmm. Department of Energy. Uh, and so the idea was to get those five agencies to sign an MOU and kind of weave together these federal uh, government services uh, and put them in the hands of local leaders in communities around the country. So it's not saying you know federal government saying this is how you do it. This is saying we are going to try to work together smarter. You take 
this framework we're calling E3 and mold it to however you want to um, uh, accomplish your goals at the local level. So that's how it started. And it's uh, been three years in operation. And it's now active in now, I think, 26 states. Uh, and we've learned a lot of uh, lessons about how economic can really bloom. Um, it, during the process, there were folks in, uh, in rural areas coming at us and saying, hey, you know, we have a lot of factories and facilities, mechanized facilities in ag land. So how do we, uh, uh, you know, go from there? Well, we took the, the model from the Department of Commerce, which was based on longstanding trust with that agency, and we turned to the Department of Agriculture and saying, well, in ag land, who, you know, which federal agency do, do, do folks out there trust the most? And that's USDA. And even though um, here in Washington, um, uh, Doug O'Brien and uh, Lillian Salerno aren't all on this call, they are a part of this uh, E3 team, which makes up uh, six agencies. They're here in Washington uh, appointees at USDA. And they're a key piece of E3. So even though I'm at EPA, I'm one of uh, this, uh, uh, the six agencies. I'm representing all six agencies in E3 and talking to you today um, about how this has gone and how it, it can go uh, forward. So what is E3? All right, so you got these six agencies that are working together. They've been doing it uh, uh, for three years. What does that mean? So um, it, it means going into communities where there is local leadership. Uh, they can get all of the various uh, critical uh, parties to, to the same table. That would be the manufacturers themselves who, who want to improve their operations. Uh, that could uh, be uh, local chambers of commerce. That would be the representatives of the various agencies, um, other consultants, who, whoever it could be the utilities. Utilities oftentimes partner up in these E3 operations because in different states there are state incentives uh, uh, that uh, reward utilities for reducing the demand um, uh, of, uh, that, uh, of energy by their customers. So um, there's usually an initi initial meeting in communities uh, to, to bring stakeholders together to see if a local uh, area can use this framework to achieve their own goals. So if, if it seems ripe to do that, then oftentimes that includes manufacturers or facility owners, mechanized facility owners, whatever they may be, to say, OK, I, I don't have much time, but I, I would like to dedicate some time to trying to uh, assess how I could improve my facility. And so that's where uh, the technical capability and know-how of these various agencies, which has heretofore been kind of uh, just in our silos of the federal government in each of those six agencies, instead it's more woven together, uh, you know, to look at um, smarter uses of energy, you, looking at smarter uses of water, of materials, to so reduce all of these various wastes um, that exist in facilities all around the country. And um, so, so these experts, um, will go onto the factory floor and do a kind of a comprehensive assessment. And then give these, these uh, uh, factory facility owners a kind of a checklist, a punch list of opportunities where they can tune up their operations. So they spend less money on waste and have more money for job creation, more money for profits, more money for uh, investment, finding uh, finding new ways to make products, new processes, uh, finding new markets for export. Um, so uh, one size doesn't fit all. It's different everywhere in, e in every community around the country. Um, uh, but that's its strength at the same time, is that it's dependent on local leaders. And, um, and so, uh, so a question comes up, well, how does this get funded? Well, this, this is no new money. This is by stitching together existing money and best practices wherever it may exist. For example, in my silo, the EPA, we might have some pollution prevention grants that might help facilitate some of the convenings and some of the audits that might happen. The Department of Energy uh, has their own programs and some monies for this, uh, and so on and so forth throughout these federal agencies. But then there's also state agencies and local agencies. Sometimes 
city governments and mayor's offices are taking charge of it. We have chambers of commerce in some communities standing up and saying, hey, we want to be the convening force in E3 in this, in this uh, uh, jurisdiction. Um, and, and increasingly, foundations who are looking for more purposeful use of their private funds to get triple bottom line benefits are participating in these kinds of E3 activities. So um, again, one size doesn't fit all, and um, and we're 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 making progress by 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 kind of looking at what are the common denominators of successful economic development. E3 is not the only place-based initiative the Obama administration um, launched in the last three, four years. There have been a, a variety of them. Some of you on the phone have, have probably heard of them, sustainable communities, and strong cities, strong communities. Well, at the end of the first term, we all got together and, and said, what are, what are some common denominators of all of these place-based bottom-up initiatives where we're trying to be smarter government, but not dictating the way that economic development ought to go? Um, and and we, we came, came up with three really kind of critical components, which are present in E3 as well as all these other place-based initiatives. And that is the, the strength of, of, of progress really depends on, one, a strong backbone organization. Someone at the local level, like I described some of those examples, taking charge in, in, a, state, in, a, in a city, in a region, in a state to say, hey, you know, we will be the sense of continuity as we bring stakeholders together to, uh, to do things smarter. The second thing is uh, uh, bringing the best um, uh, tools and best practices to assess strengths and weaknesses. So in, in, on the factory floor, there are all kinds of uh, best practices that, that are held in our scientific agencies and through experience at the federal and state and local level that are not brought to bear in the real world uh, of, of factories and facilities. So uh, E3 the framework of E3 can help that assessment piece. So building a backbone organization, number one, doing an assessment of strengths and weaknesses, and then coming up with number three, two, coming up with number three, a, uh, coming up with a tune-up strategy. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it would be the third common denominator to E3 and all of these place-based initiatives. So, so that's what E3 is. And, and, and if you jump on the website, and you'll hear a lot more about it, it's e3.gov. Um, it's www.e3.gov. You'll see uh, uh, the same description uh, 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 told a better way, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and, but most importantly, there will be a lot of stories about people doing it in the real world, about the city of Milwaukee, who's the mayor's office to charge and say, OK, we're going to be the convening authority. The state of Alabama did the same thing across the state. Same thing with North Carolina that has gone beyond what what uh, uh, E3 has originally begun and started to add additional services to their uh, uh, to their uh, suite of uh, offerings to communities and manufacturers uh, and facilities to help uh, improve um, uh, the bottom line, not just for the companies involved, but for the community because it's a it's a community operation uh, as well as for the the manufacturers and facility owners. So. Um, uh, the good news is uh, it's it's kind of grown organically because you know we just we just don't have the resources to to um, to push E3 unless there's that local leadership that local backbone that I talked about uh, and so uh, in just uh, three years like I said it's active in 26 states um, and and growing uh, quickly um, and we're excited that that the White House is also um, taken notice of this. Um, at the end of the first term, of course, it, uh, most folks remember the president uh, laying out in his State of the Union address about the importance of, um, uh, for the long term, a rising, thriving middle class in America that you know we've had uh, the last 30 years. The middle class has is, is really gone down in household income and a lot of other metrics. Well, if we're going to arrest that decline and really have a growing middle class, we need to have manufacturing um, and facilities thrive. The president made that crystal clear in the State of the Union address in 2012, ran on that, got reelected, and then in 2013, State of the Union address reemphasized the point and saying we have to be a you know a magnet. Our communities need to be a magnet for jobs and manufacturing. 
and had several initiatives underneath that. So uh, one of those initiatives um, is called IMCP. It stands for Investing in Manufacturing Communities Partnership. And it took E3 and other place-based initiatives and, uh, and uh, uh, created this kind of race to invest, to try to help communities become more attractive using E3 and these other place-based initiatives. So we're excited that the, that's a sign of, of progress. Um, you can read more about this White House initiative, IMCP, also on the E3 website, which is www.e3.gov. So uh, we're excited about that. We're developing a, uh, uh, a playbook for communities to use so they can tap into all of the various resources that I've described. This is a really exciting project. Uh, it's going to be announced uh, on Thursday at the White House and going public. This is the, the White House IMCP playbook. Um, we'll give you more information about that later, but it's also on the E3 website. But the ambition there is to really kind of build a open source, um, uh, continuously improving place uh, where folks and communities can connect the dots on how to bring together uh, local leaders and tap into resources uh, available to help build a backbone organization, assess their strengths and weaknesses, and come up with a community tune-up strategy. So those are the, the three parts of the playbook. Same thing, there are you know, components of the E3 progress. So. Um, so that's going to be coming online. So, so all that is, is good progress. You're going to hear more about the details. And, and more importantly, you're going to hear about how it's applying in Montana. Uh, so we're, we're lucky to, uh, to have Mylish uh, 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 starting to build out um, E3 in Montana, which, of course, uh, it naturally has a uh, ag element to it. And, uh, and looking forward to hearing about that today. Um, I mean, how E3 develops in, in Montana is really just up to you all on, on the line here. Um, and, you know, how, how state and local leaders use the framework. You know, you can, I, I, we like the, the word framework over, over program because it's really a framework that can be bent and twisted to however uh, it, needs, it needs to go to meet the needs of, of local and state leaders. So it's about building partnerships and, and trust. And uh, we're excited to, to, to offer whatever we have in our silos here at the federal government and in our regional affiliates um, and, and work with you all to, to, to make it work in Montana. So why don't I stop there, uh, Myla, let me check in and see how we are on time and, and we'll Thank go from you. there. Yes, thank you very much, Matt. I, I appreciate that, and I I think that it was a great um, preamble to I mean the the concept of of E three being a framework and and applying it to what's important to your state or what's important to your community. And so obviously in Montana and also really throughout EPA's Region eight, which is um, an area that I serve as a, a pollution prevention center, agriculture is very important. And I'll talk about that in in a few minutes. But first. Um, I invited um, two of our senators, Mike Phillips and Sue Mallet, here today to to just kind of um, to frame that um, that importance of agriculture in Montana and the importance of agriculture to our rural communities and some of the challenges that we're facing there. And then we'll um, go into a discussion of exactly how we're applying this particular framework to our agricultural sector. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce Sue Malik, um, one of our state senators from Missoula, I believe. Correct, Sue? That's correct. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. I can hear you perfectly. All right. I am in Missoula, which is the far western part of the state. And today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our number one industry being agriculture and our number two industry being tourism and the relationship between those two important industries to Montana. Of our 93 million acres in Montana, 66% of the total land area is in agriculture. This provides for our state not only the income of over a billion dollars a year of income and ultimately taxes that support the many important programs in our state, but also provides access for us to hunt and fish and 
recreate on public lands through agricultural lands. It provides the landscape that we love. I was originally raised in Baker, Montana, which is in the far eastern part of this state. And so my memories are of watching thunderstorms approach from 200 miles away. And I love the Great Plains. Ultimately, in, in high school, we moved to Conrad. And the difference between the income in the two areas related especially to agriculture, both are agricultural communities. Conrad is in the Golden Triangle. And the income level is much higher there. The educational opportunities and closeness to um, metropolitan areas was a benefit to that community. So I witnessed that change. I also lost my, my landscape picture. Um, ultimately, I moved to Missoula. And so I've been away from agriculture for quite a while. But it's importance to me, the reason I've stayed in this state is I can walk out my back door and into the mountains and out onto the landscape easily. So I have a quote because Myla said we could wax poetic here. And I'm sure you all know it from John Steinbeck, Travels with Charlie. I'm in love with Montana. For other states, I have admiration, respect, recognition, even some affection. But with Montana, it is love. And it's difficult to analyze love when you're in it. And so we are working hard in Montana to maintain our agriculture um, component. Our problem is drought and an aging population in the farm community, youth who can't afford to get into agriculture, so we have some real challenges, and I'm very excited about this project because it will help farmers reduce their costs and ultimately improve their profits. We're losing land. Um, the American Land Trust we're, figures we're losing agricultural land at about 35 acres a day, and we see that in important areas. For instance, where Senator Phillips is from, around Bozeman, and up in the Flathead Valley around Glacier Park. We have some of the prime agricultural land in our state being lost to subdivision. I'm so glad today that um, Senator Phillips is here because he actually works in this area. And um, I have to mention one more thing before I close, and that is um, in the Potomac Valley, which is just north east of Missoula, we have a group called the Blackfoot Challenge, working to preserve land and restore land and water resources in that area. We also have the Clark Fork Coalition, which works to preserve and restore the Clark Fork River, one of the largest um, uh, restoration sites in the nation. And they own a ranch in Deer Lodge and are using that as a demonstration site. So I'm excited about the efforts um, that you all are talking about. I think we have some good framework going here that can be expanded. And um, I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. That, so that was wonderful. Um, Mike, I have, Mike you I have you unmuted, unmuted but, um, but um, I'm, I'm giving a little, bit of, a little bit of feedback. So you so would like to add like anything to what Sue had to say? Well, well, first, uh, Myla, can you hear me okay? Yes, now I yeah. hear you great. And, and probably no feedback? No. no. Good, okay. Not much uh, you know, <laughs> folks, I, I really don't have much to add. Uh, Sue did a great job uh, creating a, a Montana-based context. Uh, she's right. I, I do serve in an area that, that uh, has been characterized by the sprawl bomb. And when we speak to losing ag lands, it's not uncommonly in Montana lost due to sprawl. It's hard to make a ranching living on a 40-acre ranchette. And most folks that want a 40-acre ranchette don't want to farm. They want to look at the, at the mountains in, on the distant horizon. Uh, there's, there's lots, I suppose, we could imagine doing in Montana. I must admit, Milo, I'm still a bit confused as to how we make E3 come to life for Montana's agricultural community. Uh, Sue mentioned drought. There, there is no doubt, and Sue didn't mention this, but I've spent the, the bulk of my legislative career focusing on energy policy and, and climate change. Uh, and, and we've had really very little success 
moving the, the, you know, advancing the needle on progressive policies that speak to a new energy paradigm that's mindful of things like, like climate change. The, the, the best science indicates Montana will become increasingly more arid. And so it certainly makes sense that we become increasingly obsessed with water conservation. There may be some support provided by E3 that could promote increased efforts to conserve water. For, for this to go anywhere, if we're imagining that the legislature has a role to play in making E3 a reality in Montana, we have to get some Republican uh, legislators involved Sue and I, uh, we're actually seatmates in the Senate, and she knows as well as I do, now, at least initially, progressive ideas don't tend to go very far. Now, we're, we're deep in the mi minority, and, and it's tough to, to move a progressive idea. So we, we've got to get folks from the other side of the aisle. They're great people. They serve Montana well. They work very hard. They admittedly, most of them see the world a bit differently than I do, now, but I benefit from their view of things and that they would have a mighty big role to play in E3. And so one thing we might consider, Myla, as early as the 2015 session, and I think Senator Malik would be a great teammate to help me on this, we could draft a very simple resolution, a joint resolution that would hopefully pass the Senate and the House of Representatives that would that would speak to the legislature's support for the for the essence of E3. It doesn't necessarily put any boots on the ground it being the resolution, but it might do much to begin to mainstream the thinking about E3. So in in, uh, in 15 and beyond, boots are being put on the ground in a manner that makes sense. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate those insights. We all do. And um, I think with that, I think you guys will be on the line. So um, if we have questions as we go through the presentation or get to the end, um, I hope that we'll be able to field some of those at the end. But thank you both very much. With that, I think I'm going to go ahead and begin, um, as Mike was saying, um, or wondering, you know, how does this type of framework, how could this work in, in Montana agriculture? And I think we've um, We've gone through the process of, um, uh, of trying to, to figure out how this could work and, and what makes sense. So um, once again, I just wanted to um, introduce myself. I'm Myla Kelly. I'm the coordinator for EPA's uh, Region 8 Pollution Prevention Information Center, which serves the states of North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado. Um, we're located at Montana State University in Bozeman um, and are part of Extension's Housing and Environmental Health Department. Um, in addition, in addition to serving as a pollution prevention center, we also coordinate the National Tribal Pollution Prevention Workgroup, um, which is comprised of over 80 tribes around the country. And regionally, we manage a, a greening local government initiative. Um, I've managed our pollution prevention center for a little over four years now. And, and what I love most about it is, is being able to convene professionals with a vested in interest um, in the environment. And it's, I think it's through that convening process that um, we're all able to obviously learn from one another, but not just that, but kind of uh, to move forward and, and see some, um, some progress made. Let's see. OK, so um, as we heard Matt describe the E3 framework, um, this is a slightly different model. Um, the E3 in, agriculture, in Montana agriculture is a slightly different model sort of housed within that framework. Um, but as we heard from Senators Malik and Phillips, agriculture is one of the largest economic sectors in our region. Um, over half the landscape in Region 8 is devoted to agriculture. In Montana, as Senator Malik was saying, we're closer to two-thirds of our landscape that's devoted to agriculture. We have 30,000 farms in Montana um, that average a couple of thousand acres each. So from an economic perspective, it's very important. From an environmental perspective, there's also widespread environmental impacts to the environment from agriculture. Um, so agriculture and, en and energy efficiency within um, the sector of agriculture really makes sense for our state and for our region. So we came with, up with this idea um, in 2012, where we, we began some discussions with the E3 partners. Um, and we were awarded a, a source reduction grant to sort of get things off the ground. Um, our objective through this grant was through hands-on E3 assessments, we would work with the agricultural community to reduce energy consumption, to increase productivity, to minimize carbon emissions, 
to prevent pollution and drive innovation, all very, very lofty goals. Um, in fall 2012, we had a number of uh, meetings with potential partners, and we'll talk a, a little bit more about that, um, the importance of USDA and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, we were, we conducted our assessments um, in the last year. We've completed five. Um, we'll hear about those. And then we were awarded um, a Region 8 source reduction grant for $90,000 to expand this pilot to statewide implementation in the next year. Our goal, um, well, through our project development and meetings, particularly with our potential uh, USDA partners, we came up with this overarching goal, um, which is to ensure that that by participating in E3, we have put our agricultural producers in the best position possible to maximize available financial opportunities in order to implement E3 recommendations. So the goal is simple, but it's very important because this goal and, and coming at this um, project from that perspective um, was critical in how we would do our assessments and how we would follow up with our assessments um, and who we would need, how we would um, train um, our extension agents um, and, and just how, how we would go about it. So we needed to figure out what the highest bar was if we want to put our ag producers in the best position possible to maximize financial opportunities, we need to make sure that we're conducting our assessments that in a way that's meeting that highest bar. So how do we make that happen? Um, well, as we can imagine, um, you know, the environmental benefit from doing one energy efficiency assessment is probably not much. And while we would hope that there would be an economic benefit for that producer, obviously that's our goal, um, to see any kind of mighty environmental benefit on the landscape, we need a big multiplier. So we need to do a lots of assessments. And we need to identify lots of opportunities for energy efficiency. So number one, we need to find willing producers. We need access to farmers' land and their operations. And there can be a trust issue here when we list out all of the different agencies that are involved with E3. Um, they are great federal partners, but our Montana farmers are dealing with old regulations, new regulations from all these different agencies, changing regulations, uncertainty about the Farm Bill, um, all those kinds of things, which, which, um, which, which are a reality that they face um, day in, day out. And so we need to recognize that there, that there is um, an understandable trust hurdle with that, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the second thing we need to do was we need to conduct the assessments. We need boots on the ground, um, and we need to find those folks that are maybe not convinced of going to no-till, or maybe they're not sure about um, how to upgrade their machinery or, or to conduct maintenance on their diesel machinery. Um, just you know, those folks that are are thinking about doing some putting in some solar stock water tanks, but they kind of want to see what their neighbors doing before they jump into it, and and they want to see if it makes sense. Um, and the third thing we need to do is to secure implementation dollars. So we need to not only identify what some energy efficiency or environmental opportunities are, but we need to be able to say, well, here's a grant program that fits that recommendation. Let's go for it, and let's see if we can secure you some funding in order to go ahead and, um, and implement some of those ideas. And it's only through the ability to secure those implementation dollars that will actually be able to sort of get the ball rolling by getting farmers to tell farmers that this is a good project, that this works, that they can get cost share funding for it. So with all of these different agencies and opportunities and partners that are involved, how do we get, a, how do we solve that challenge of gaining trust? How do we get the boots on the ground and get the farmers brought in? And I think this is where um, the model that we've chosen through this project is um, is something that uh, that could work in, with both within the state and, and outside of the state as well. Um, we have chosen. Um, I work within within extension, and we've chosen um, to to use the extension model to use our extension agents um, to train them in the in in being able to conduct these energy efficiency assessments um, in order to kind of cross some of these hurdles that we were just talking about. Um, 
extension agents have been working in the field since, I believe it's 1914, I think we're almost up to 100 years. Um, extension is in every county um, within the state, and they, um, they were originally um, put into place by, um, the, by Congressman Morrill with 1862 to um, establish land-grant institutions to really teach the practice of agriculture and, um, and take the engineering and science of agriculture to the common folk. Um, so basically sending agents um, who have had the education and the expertise into rural areas to bring that research to our end users. And I think that it's using this cooperative extension partnership um, that, is, that I think can make this E3 concept in ag a real success. Um, another really important partnership in this is the um, is the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, Dan's going to talk a little bit about how we have used all of their amazing tools that they have developed. But um, rather than reinventing the wheel, um, Natural Resource Conservation Service um, have conservationists that work on ag land as well. Um, and importantly, they have developed numerous technical tools, such as the Cropland Energy Estimator, that um, has become really important in calculating our E3 metrics. Um, NRCS also has the funding sources, such as Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And I was talking in a couple a couple slides ago about what our highest bar is um, and ensuring that our assessments com are compliant or they meet that highest bar. And, um, and this is the highest bar that we've found. So um, this is a, um, in order to be able to qualify for this particular type of, um, of funding, there has to be um, a service provider. You have to that that energy assessment has to be um, has to be uh, approved, sort of like an auditor um, that uh, they have to approve this assessment, which is harder than it sounds because there's only a handful of qualified technical service providers, and there's only three in Montana. Again, these are people with qualifications to kind of rubber stamp energy assessments, not rubber stamp them in a negative way at all, but um, that approve these energy assessments so that they can qualify for EQIP, but also for some um, FSA funds as well. And Dan will talk a little bit more about how that, what that looks like on the ground. Our other key partners in this E3 Montana effort is rural development. Um, Montana, rural development is a component of USDA, um, and as Montana is almost entirely a rural state, um, they, we are, um, rural development can bring many different um, financial funding opportunities to the table. Some of the grants and loan opportunities that they have available for ag producers include Renewable Energy for America, Value Added Producer Grants, and Loan Guarantee Programs. And again, these are, these are just programs that can help us fund um, uh, energy efficiency opportunities once we've been able to identify those. Um, and then finally, the other USDA program that is critical um, in, in perhaps matching funding opportunities with, um, with recommendations for energy efficiency is the Farm Services Agency. Um, FSA makes guaranteed loans to family farmers and ranchers to promote, build, and sustain family farms in support of a thriving um, agricultural economy. So their guaranteed conservation loan seems like it might be a good fit for many of our producers. So I, um, uh, Dan's going to talk about um, some of these things in a little bit more detail in a second, but um, to qualify for our highest bar, um, as I mentioned, we're following the NRCS um, technical service provider model, which um, divides agricultural production into two categories, landscape and headquarters. So simply speaking, the headquarters is kind of a buildings and operations, whereas the landscape is sort of the production practices. And obviously there's a lot of sort of gray areas in between, but, um, but we have divided our energy audits into, into those categories. So one of the primary energy efficiency opportunities that, we're, that we see on ag lands is um, diesel efficiency. And something through this pilot that we've really recognized is not necessarily captured in NRCS work is diesel maintenance. For example, if your tires are underinflated by 10 PSI, um, you know, were you to be at an, at an ideal pressure based on the number of miles traveled, you would save X gallons of diesel, X number of dollars, and prevent X number of pounds of greenhouse gas emissions. So very, sometimes very simple, but sometimes not simple, um, diesel um, maintenance efficiency. And we have found that 
um, we really need to build that knowledge capacity for our E3 assessors. Um, finding folks with that um, with that knowledge base has proven a little bit challenge, more challenging than we thought. Um, but our extension agents are realizing more and more that that component of diesel efficiency is really critical to um, our farmers as far as um, saving money and using less diesel. So we're working with um, um, our university partners at Northern to try and um, kind of build that, that knowledge capacity for our extension agents so that they'll be able to go out into the field and be able to advise producers on that exact issue. Um, the other kind of big area that we're seeing that Mike alluded to too from the water conservation perspective is irrigation efficiency and that, that comes through um, both from a water conservation perspective and from an energy efficiency perspective. And so um, we're using NRCS's uh, models to uh, do a very good job at, at, um, at capturing what some en environmental, some, from a conservation benefit and from a cost benefit, what some, um, what some opportunities are when, um, for going through the irrigation efficiency process. So our assessments, one that you'll hear about in a minute, have taken us to the corners and borders of the state we've used. We've had assessments in organic production on the High Line, Dryland Ag in the Northeast, and we're going to hear about one of those assessments in Southwest Montana and, um, and show you a little bit about how that can work on the ground. Okay, Dan. Uh, thank you, Myla. Um, I guess begin by recognizing the agents that went through the training that uh, Myla had put on earlier this year here in Phillipsburg. Uh, my uh, compadre over in Livingston at Park County Extension Agent Tracy Mosley also in the western region and then in the central region we have Nicole Bray in Haver and Chrissy Cook in Stanford. And in the eastern region of Montana, we have Tim Fine in uh, Sydney and Byron Gold out of uh, Forsyth. So there are six of us across the state that are working uh, closely with Myla to put the E-Tree programming together. And this morning, I'd like to talk a little bit about one uh, case study in particular. It's the Skinner Ranch in Hall, Montana. I think it's fitting that we started with Matt with a large picture of what was happening nationwide with E3 and then um, from the senators to bring us to a Montana perspective. Now we'll go all the way down and take a look at how this program on the agricultural side of it works for uh, one, one operator in particular. Um, the Skinner Ranch is just west of Hall. I'll give you a brief description. It's primarily a breeding stock operation that raises um, bulls and cows um, to uh, serve as breeding stock for uh, cow-calf producers across Montana and across the United States. They spend a lot of their spring delivering bulls. But anyway, their um, impetus for looking at E3 was uh, efficiency in using energy. And energy is one of the variable input costs for agricultural producers that responds well to management. In other words, there are opportunities to look at either new technologies or new ways to work with uh, existing technologies to reduce the unit amount of energy consumed and or the cost associated with energy expenditures to produce agricultural commodities. And that's what was really interesting for the Skinner operation is not so much on how do we minimize or maximize energy use, but how do we take the units of energy that we do use and optimize the commodities that we produce with that. And the tools that were presented uh, based primarily in NRCS uh, computer-based tools did an excellent job of identifying uh, those areas that we're working well in right now and identifying opportunities to improve efficiency. Uh, and as Myla indicated, we break the operation into two, uh, two areas. The landscape evaluation essentially is from the irrigation pumping station out to the field and everything that goes into that energy consumption portion of the operation, whether it's uh, diesel consumption for uh, field operations and or uh, diesel and or electrical consumption for delivering uh, irrigation water for, for crop production, and then everything from the 
uh, pumping station back towards the house uh, is considered part of the headquarters. So obviously that varies with the type of operation. Uh, a dryland grain producer in the Golden Triangle obviously has a different operation than somebody who's got a, um, a feedlot and um, feed mixing station in Hall, Montana. Those are different types of operations, so we look at different sorts of things between those. I'd like to begin the discussion with, with this inner case study looking at the landscape evaluation. And Miley, could you go ahead one slide? Great. Um, apologize for the size of this slide. I'll just go through uh, what's there. When we look at what is available, this is a copy of an energy audit that was uh, for one of the pumping stations on the Skinner Ranch. And the reason I wanted to put this up is uh, they're on the audit or on the uh, pump, pumping station itself. You can identify the, the pump type, pump size, um, and the, and the engine size that goes with that. And then RCS has a tool that allows you to place that information um, in a search engine that will bring up the efficiency curve for that particular pump. We had the benefit in this case of having um, Northwestern Energy had, com had completed this energy audit. And if you look on down the line here, we can look at um, down towards the bottom third of the page where it says horsepower and efficiency calculations, it will tell you, um, based on the pump curve that we can derive from uh, NRCS uh, materials, what the overall pumping plant efficiency is and then how well we are using the energy. In other words, of the, of the electricity that's being consumed to deliver power to that pump by that electric motor, how much is, how efficient is that? You'll notice it says 66.3%. Um, and that may seem somewhat low, but it's it's well within where that pump is operating most efficiently because we look at down below at the bottom of that where it says motor efficiency is at 92.4%, which is excellent. Pump efficiency is at 71.8%, which is right in the sweet spot of where the pump efficiency should be. So this particular uh, pump and motor combination as shown by the, the energy efficiency uh, evaluation is doing quite doing its job quite well. So that's the one side of the of the equation is, is the energy consumed by the motor used by the pump to deliver water. I like to move ahead one more. So then we look at, okay, if we are consuming a certain amount of energy, what is the real effect on where are we going with crop production on the side of that? And that's the other portion of the energy audit report that then allows us to say, okay, when is the consumption happening? How can we use that to either avoid or mitigate um, demand charges for irrigation pumping? Uh, and then what is the total amount of energy consumed? Which in the bottom line, when we look at whether it's Skinner's or any other operation, we can take these figures and look at units of energy consumed to produce unit of product or unit of commodity produced and then put together what the variable cost is, in this case per ton of hay, how much energy is consumed and or how much energy expenditure is made to, con to produce that ton of hay. Um, Mike, can you move ahead for one more? So then what this slide then tells you is we take the, the uh, energy efficiency figures from the audit report from that pump efficiency curve and look at what can we do to look at, at improving that efficiency or what opportunities are there to uh, make, this, uh, make the operation more efficient. And looking at the water use, we're looking at uh, 113 feet per uh, over the entire operation on, on this particular uh, pumping system. And then we can go back and look at what is the energy consumed or what's the water consumption per um, per unit of production. And we have less, I guess, management uh, control over that because uh, Water consumed per unit of production of the crop is more or less controlled by heat, wind, weather, evapotranspiration rates, things that uh, we don't have control over. But it's a good figure to look at and let us know where we are on, on consuming water for this particular operation. Um, then we move over to energy cost analysis. And you notice at the bottom part of that, if we add a flow meter to this system, we can save $132 per year, which is one of the things then we can look at 
are there opportunities to improve our efficiency? Flow meters cost, uh, on average, about $3,000. So if we looked at adding a $3,000 um, piece of technology to the system, we could save $132 annually based upon uh, current rates for electricity. So we can tell that while there is some opportunity to improve that, uh, we'd be looking at somewhere around a 20-year payback to even begin making money on that. So it, even though there may be a small advantage, this program allows us to identify how much is that advantage, is it an economic uh, way to look at that. So even though in this case we didn't opt to, to use a, a flow meter, um, it does give that analysis. So those, that tool is available as well. Okay, next one, Lila. Then we can look at the crop side of it. Now, up to this point, we've looked at the energy pumping station and what we're going to be looking at um, and allows you to look at in specific for each operation. Now, we're taking this right down to the producer level. If you look uh, past the ranch sort of thing, if you get down to the crop, uh, crop interval, name and growth date, and those things, each one of those pink boxes or salmon colored boxes allows a drop down menu. So we can look at alfalfa grown production and then under the specific crop uh, description, it allows you to look at different production systems and then assigns it uh, the ability to look at uh, where are we on um, different amounts of, of uh, Where, where are we on um, consuming energy for that crop? And I'm going to have to go to slides here on the side because my screen just went black. black. So let me bring up the slides here on my own. Um, but if we follow that through then, we look at the different crop rotation and where we are on uh, on consuming energy and where that comes to on on each portion of the operation. And those for the Skinner operation, the part of the crop rotation goes to triticale after it's the uh, after we have the uh, the alfalfa uh, rome hay production. Then if we go um, the thing that I like best about this particular tool, it's the crop energy estimator tool that comes through NRCF. The thing I like best about this tool is it allows us to do what if uh, calculation? In other words, there's another portion of this tool that goes to the uh, that says, okay, what if we did a different crop rotation? What if we tried different plowing systems? What if we tried different uh, levels of production? What if we tried different crop mixes? It allows you to more or less play what if games on what we're going to do with that. And then um, I often go to the next slide and look at. Uh, the level of crop yield based upon our inputs, and if you'll notice over on the, uh, as we move to the right, it talks about root mass and surface residue. This then begins to look at what sort of organic material we're per, uh, putting back into the soil and how well that's going to work uh, in, in soil building exercises without using uh, inorganic or synthetic inputs into that system. The other thing that the uh, NRCS system allows us to do is to look at soil amendments applied and part of one of those things is seed, so it allows you to put seeding rates in as related back to crop production. And if we go all the way to the bottom and look at agrochemicals applied, it allows you to look at different levels of fertilization or different crops that are put in. In this particular case, with the with the Skinner operation, we look at the alfalfa grown production. We're putting on about 100 pounds of 11 go fertilizer with another 100 pounds of potash that gives us the 40 pounds of potassium. And it allows us, and we'll see that in the next slide as we move forward here in a minute, um, it allows us to cap energy into production of that soil. And all the way over in the right-hand column is uh, can capture energy uh, expenditures that go in with pesticide application as well. And this particular one looks at alfalfa weevil um, management. Uh, next slide. Now, this is the this is perhaps one of the slides that drew most attention on the uh, on the Skinner Ranch is that it assigns the a different amount of diesel use that comes from uh, research based information. Uh, Iowa has some as well, Nebraska has some as well. Um, 
and it allows you to look at how many gallons per acre is consumed for different portions of the operation. Now, this allows you to look at what if we go to a no-till system? What if we look at uh, different types of plowing? What if we only disk uh, once? What if we don't? Uh, what if we use different types of planters? Are there opportunities to get the job done by consuming less diesel fuel? And again, it allows uh, the person to go through and kind of play what if games with how do you put together the best combination of practices that optimize the amount of energy consumed, the amount of commodity produced. And then we can look at different uh, opportunities to, to do that. You notice the next uh, portion of that down goes through uh, the triticale portion of that. And if, if you remember back to the slide previous, there was no uh, um, fertilizer assigned to the triticale production, but between the alfalfa nitrogen fixation and uh, working the the fertilizer up with the alfalfa produced, we can go through a year of the triticale production without any added material, which is another uh, benefit that we have. Uh, as my next slide, Myla. Um, as Myla indicated, one of the other things that we're concerned about or take a look at is the greenhouse gas emission uh, coefficient or, or the amount of, of greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases that are produced, and with the program, the energy. Uh, Cropland Energy Estimator will also allow us to look through each of these alternatives and get an idea of how much uh, greenhouse gases in quantity are released by each of the uh, different practices. I think one of the things that's interesting from the production side of things, and it allows you to have a, uh, a baseline to compare different practices, that column on the left that says energy and it's in millions of BTUs, because BTUs are an expense unit or an input expense unit and it allows a producer to look at the bottom line and say, okay, and with these types of practices, where do I optimize the amount of BTUs expended to produce that level of commodity? So it, it allows you to have a, a baseline across the board on how uh, different practices to optimize that, that level. And then the, uh, the greenhouse gas uh, emissions go right along with that. I point at the bottom of this that it also allows it, you know, there's a zip code in there, uh, that's the Hall Montana zip code, and it allows you to customize that uh, zip code based on different environmental conditions that are I, that are keyed into or tied to uh, zip codes for location that, that influence the ways that uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gases are emitted as well. I want to take a look at the headquarters considerations you have the next slide. Um, and take a look at what we uh, evaluate there, and that is anything that consumes energy at the headquarters of the United States uh, towards the house or towards the, um, the farmstead, ranchstead from the irrigation pumps. Um, one of the things we looked at in particular with the, with the Skinner Ranch was a, a new shop, and it was kind of nice that they had a new shop, and they were diligent in looking at um, optimizing their energy usage at that time. But uh, we go through and look at how much uh, energy is consumed in lighting and heating and the day-to-day -day maintaining of the, the facility and operations that go on there. Uh, in this particular case, they have already been uh, very diligent, as I say, about that. And they have um, energy-free, frost-free waters uh, across their pens for raising the bowls. They have just built a new shop. Uh, part of that was insulating the floor and then running an external wood heater that, uh, that heats the entire thermal mass of the, of the shop. So that's very efficient. And they went through with uh, a lighting specialist to make sure that the lighting was the best that they could do. And Mike, we have one more slide on that. Because the other thing that we've got with the uh, NRCS tools is to go through and evaluate opportunities by to change lighting and or heating installations and opportunities that exist there to improve the efficiency of, of energy expenditures, um, maybe not in the field, but there around the ranch set itself. So you can go through and put through in this uh, particular application the types of lamps, the wattage lengths, the number of uh, fixtures that are there and get an idea of, of how much energy is consumed and if there is an opportunity there to improve the, the way that that energy is expended. And then, uh, my one last slide there, we take a look at um, the different lighting uh, 
technologies that are available to minimize the amount of energy consumed to produce the necessary amount of light to, to achieve the objective. In other words, um, one of the other things, particularly in a shop, is safety. We want to be able to have enough light to see what we're doing and uh, get the job taken care of. And this uh, list of lighting op uh, alternatives gives you an idea on how to achieve the optimal amount of light or the, the necessary uh, light required to do the job in the, in the most efficient way. And that's all I've got with the Skinner Ranch study. I would say that uh, they were very happy with the uh, results. I provided them with a copy of the um, energy report that also includes very uh, detailed soil information. And uh, just talking with them this spring, they were able to produce uh, this fall, they were able to produce a half ton per acre additional hay based upon looking at the irrigation systems as we looked at in the spring. Uh, so while their energy uh, consumption didn't change drastically, when you look at it as a per unit of commodity produced, they did increase efficiency by a half ton per acre with the same energy consumption. Um, I'll turn it back over to you. Excellent. Dan, thank you so much. I love this um, this presentation because it <laughs> we've gone from this you know high level concept of what E three was and the signing of the memorandums of understanding between these all of these different federal federal agencies, and we've gone from that down to like what this actually looks like on the ground as far as you know from worksheet to calculator, and so. Um, I think as we um, can see that whole range of um, big picture to little picture, I think we can see that um, that there can that there are opportunities there, and we all saw that um, in in all of our um, in in all the audits or the assessments that we did. And there's also tools that are there. NRCS has an excellent one that um, that Dan was just showing, and. Um, and there's others like that. But, and then on the other side of the coin, there are also funding opportunities through all these federal um, partners that, um, that, we've, that Matt was talking about um, that are part of this kind of E3 framework. And so being able to pull all of those things together um, is, is kind of the trick here, but they all exist. So um, as Matt was saying too, we're not talking about creating um, you know, new funding mechanisms, and we're just matching together the tools that we have with the people who have the expertise to go out in the field and do this, but that requires some capacity, some training, um, which we're going through the process of doing, and matching those with, um, with some of the excellent programs that, um, that our federal partners have. Um, just as kind of a wrap up for this, I wanted to talk about um, some of those those next steps. So once we have these recommendations um, from our our um, our properties, should uh, producers want to pursue funding? Because some of them don't will not want to, and that's fine. Um, but should they want to pursue funding, where do they go? How do they apply? Who can help them apply? Um, you know, there's obvious synergies with many USDA programs that we talked a little bit about. Um, but what about other agency partners? Um, so we've got from USDA, we've got Farm Services of America, we've got rural development, their REAP program, their renewable energy and energy efficiency loan guarantees, value-added producer grants, EQIP funding. Um, and, and those are kind of obvious segues into the ag sector, but from the Department of Commerce, from the Department of Energy, from SBA, Department of Labor, EPA, what are some of those funding opportunities opportunities that they have that might fit this energy efficiency um, concept. And then sort of thinking out of these um, obvious partners, um, what are some additional maybe private funding opportunities like the sustainable agriculture, agriculture and food system funders. And I will say that um, EPA has been wonderful about, um, about trying to kind of scope out what those um, maybe a little bit less traditional, those non-traditional funding opportunities might be through the private sector. Um, so identifying a good fit once we have this laundry list of funding opportunities. Um, and then the, it's, it, the importance of these partnerships is to be able to sit down and communicate with these local RD offices, NRCS, and say, to get an indication of, yeah, I think I'm going to apply for some REAP funding for um, a grain drying bin 
will that fit under this program? And being able to have that conversation and that communication is critical in order to be able to kind of see this overarching goal play out on the ground for the producer and for an environmental benefit. Um, for projects that don't cleanly fit within a program, what are some other creative funding mechanisms? And I talked a little bit about the opportunity for private funders that, um, that EPA is working to bring into the fold of this E3 concept framework. So um, one avenue for identifying this good fit is this funding opportunities for energy efficiency projects that we're developing. It's a, it's a brochure, basically. Um, we're developing it with um, this for, you know, with an ag producer, with an extension agent, with um, maybe an economic development council audience in mind. Something that folks can look at and be able to say, oh, that would fit my project, or no, that definitely wouldn't fit. But just understanding what those universe, what the universe of funding opportunities is, um, is, is a challenge. So um, this is a draft. We're just um, developing this now. But here's an example of the level of detail of information so that our producers can, or, or extension agents can go through and look at a guaranteed conservation loan from FSA. Um, and they're funded for NRCS approved conservation plans. Again, it's, it has to be NRCS approved, and, and what we're doing is approved through that process. Um, and you can look at some example projects. You can see if you're eligible. You can see what the funding amount is, how when to apply, and how to get to the link. So very simple, straightforward. Um, guaranteed conservation loans is something that might pop to the top of your head as, oh, that sounds like it's conservation. That might fund ener energy efficiency programs. But another that might not pop to the top of your head is a direct operating loan from FSA. Um, their loans, um, while, uh, while many of the operating loans help purchase livestock, poultry, equipment, feed, seeds, those types of things, they will also assist with soil and water conservation practices. So if you're putting in, if you're looking for a cost share to put in um, a variable speed drive, um, on your irrigation system, if, you, if we've gone through this process and determined that that would save you water, that would save you energy, then this might be an avenue for you to apply for a loan or for a cost share opportunity. So there's lots of, um, so I guess our step now is, is working with our partners with EPA, Department of Commerce, da 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 da, um, to identify what those primary sources of potential funding might be. And um, the last thing was um, was just talking about um, program sustainability, and um, you know, no one understands the particular nuances and challenges for all of these diverse funding sources, like the agency programs themselves. And so, it's that relationship of being able to talk with RD, um, with the local audience, to um, to be able to get beyond. Um, beyond just the, the basics, to be able to understand whether this program, this funding program, might fit for your particular need. So we can make it a bit easier to read through the basics through that brochure, but there has to be a relationship with that funder so that Ron Skidder, if he was so inclined, could call the local RD office and say that he wants to use his E3 audit results to apply uh, for cost share and what programs do they recommend, how does he fill in the question on page 32, line 26, or whatever it is. But we all know that these funding mechanisms are very complicated. And, um, and it really takes a relationship with that funder to kind of, um, to kind of get through the weeds and, and, um, and be able to apply and, and hopefully to implement these, um, these practices. So um, in summary, um, with that, I, I just wanted to thank you all again for your time. Um, if you're an agent and you want to be part of E3, um, if you're a producer or you know a producer interested in having these assessments completed, um, if you're a federal agency and you have a funding opportunity that might fit for these types of energy efficiency recommendations, um, contact me. As I said, we've been funded to do this on a, um, as a you know, statewide implementation basis um, for the next uh, fiscal year. And, and in doing that, we're going to be increasing the capacity of our extension agents, 
both the number and the training capacity. So if it's um, you know from the diesel maintenance to um, the things that Dan was talking about today, but also in um, understanding what uh, program, what implementation programs are out there too. So those are all different aspects of, of building capacity that are all equally important in this process. Um, and, and it's that implementation piece that, that we're getting to now. Um, and with that, I guess I'll, I'll open it up for, um, well, let's see, I will look through, um, I'm going to um, give Mike Phillips, um, Senator Mike Phillips, an opportunity to add something. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, Myla, it would be uh, an honor, and I think Sue, uh, Senator Malik can help with this too. The presentation that you and Dan just gave is very, very useful. It, it provided a great deal of clarity. Uh, at a minimum, we could work to establish a joint session of the Senate Agricultural Committee and the House Ag Committee in the early part of the 2015 legislative session to, to introduce those members to, to E3. Uh, they are uh, important members typically of the ag community, uh, folks like Senator Taylor Brown. Uh, if he was aware and supportive of E3, that would do a great deal to putting even more boots uh, even more boots on, on the ground uh, in Montana. And, and I hope that you would make this slideshow available. And then I would like to schedule a time to speak with you offline uh, about some other ideas to make E3 as big and as useful a program in Montana as possible. Great. Thank you, Mike. We'll do that. And Senator, this is uh, Matt Gush in Washington, D.C. Um, if, if in that process um, we can, uh, we can uh, use um, your uh, work as an example to other uh, states um, as to one way in which you know they can move the ball forward. That would be a great, uh, a great thing for us. Uh, th th it's a great idea. Uh, I've got activities in several other states, New Mexico, for example, and and uh, several uh, Great Plains states that that uh, it would be worthwhile to introduce some producers there to E3. This is a beautiful idea, and it would be my honor to be more involved than not. Do any of our other presenters have anything to add? Myla, I just, this is Sue Malik, and I just wanted to chirp in a little bit here about um, foundations and nonprofits. As I mentioned before, the Clark Burke Coalition has a publication called Currents, and um, they're talking about paying for water leases from farmers and ranchers and restoring tributaries to the Clark Fork River and conserving water, working with ranchers and farmers to conserve water in other ways. And I know when I met Matt on the airplane, he said working with nonprofits and, and uh, foundations was an important part of this E3 project. And I'm just wondering, because of the tremendous work these organizations have been doing, if we could draw them in somehow. Um, certainly I could talk to my neighbor, who's the president of the Clark Park Coalition, and see if she could send you all um, copies of Current Magazine, but, you know, is there a way we can reach out to these folks? Thank you, Sue. I think that's a, that's a great idea as far as um, both, uh, you know, finding the producers that might be interested through those, you know, vast networks that some of these nonprofits have, and, and also sometimes um, those, I, I think, I, I would imagine that sometimes those, um, those nonprofits have, um, have they they could be part of these this assessment process. Um, I I think that um, you know as long as the training is conducted in in such a way that it's you know it's replicable and that it's it, it meets whatever the the highest bar that we've determined is, then um, I think that could be another way of partnering with with some of those um, with those nonprofits. Did anybody did any other presenters have anything to add? Myla, this is Tom Murray. Just a couple of things to add. First of all. Before we close the session, I just want to make sure that, that uh, you know, a shout out to you for your leadership on getting E3 started out there in Montana. And I, I really enjoyed this presentation. You've done just a tremendous job up there. And anything we can continue to do to support that, um, you know, we're here for you. A um, couple of other things. One, um, Matt mentioned the website for E3, www.e3.gov. 
Um, a brand new version of it just went live yesterday. So if you saw it a week ago and you go on it today, it will look entirely different. Uh, it's been upgraded. It has a lot more information in there, so please visit the site. Also, Matt mentioned the IMCP playbook and his presentation earlier. And uh, Myla, as you were sort of going through the litany of different federal agencies and all that they can offer, you know, I could probably hear a few people groaning out there about, oh my God, how do we find our way and navigate our way through all of these federal programs? Well, I think you'll be happy to see the playbook when it comes out publicly later this week because what we've tried to do there is to help people navigate their way through a lot of these programs take some two areas where there are grants available and to programs where technical assistance is available. Uh, I helped put this together and it was an enlightening adventure for me and I've been in the government for a long time. So I think that will help people navigate through and, and find a lot of these useful resources. Um, and I, just one other thing, uh, I think it probably came out crystal clear in this presentation. All of this is about just basic communication, and one of the things we've learned through E3 is that independently, everybody's changing. We're all starting to look at, at our programs and our views differently, and we would never know that unless we talk to each other. And it's been quite something to really get to understand how the federal agencies are all starting to realign their programs and most importantly how the foundations and some of, some of those types of organizations are beginning to look a bit differently at, at, at their interests and uh, they're putting out new guide, guidelines and guides, et cetera, that really are aligning their interests even cl more closely to what we're trying to do with E3. So we're going to give that our best effort as well. So I just wanted to make those points. Thank you. Um, Tom, and I wanted to ask you, there was a question um, about how the job service can perhaps assist with this effort. And I know that you, I can um, probably throw out a, a couple of ideas, but I know that you have, um, in other E3 projects, worked maybe a little bit more closely um, with, that, um, with, with that partner. Um, we're talking, well, most of the E3 exercises we have around the country, we work with the Workforce Investment Boards. Is that similar mm -hmm. to the job service? I think so. Yeah, and uh, we rely on our friends over to the Department of Labor. And in some areas, the WIBs, they call it, are at the table. And uh, the connection that we're seeing there is is as follows, that as we begin to show efficiencies within the E3 process, uh, like was just described by, by Dan, um, a lot of these manufacturers and others are starting to show such efficiencies that it actually opens up opportunities for them to actually go out and hire people, whereas in the past they didn't have that, that uh, opportunity to do so. And so in many ways we're opening up the gates, if you will, for a more active conversation between the uh, manufacturer and, and the WIB. Um, we also uh, are working very hard to get veterans uh, into the workplaces, and E3 again is opening up opportunities uh, there as well. Um, and then the other piece of it, and a much more difficult piece that we all wrestle with, is just the new technologies out there and trying to get skilled laborers um, for not only new uh, technologies, but also skilled laborers to work with old technologies. Um, this continues to be a challenge for all of us, but we're, we're finding our way through that. And if E3 really is just providing a lot of opportunities for that conversation to take place and become more efficient. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. And I just, um, one other thing to note is that I, I did have a, a comment from, um, from our Montana Department of Environmental Quality's um, alternative energy loan, uh, alternative energy revolving loan program that they offer 3.75% um, loans for up to $40,000 for solar, geothermal, biomass, etc. And so um, that's just a, another excellent point of um, being able to leverage a program that already exists and they're already doing good work with, um, with those in need and that would be through our, um, our Montana Department of Environmental Quality. So um, being able to, to work with our state partners as well. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and I, I think that um, takes care of most of our questions. Um, so I would um, 
with that, I think I'll, I'll close the presentation. I do want to just remind everybody that the presentation will be posted in the recording, since I finally remembered to press the record button, <laughs> um, will be posted on our e3.peakstoprairies.org website, and my contact information is there as well. And we will um, thank you again for all your time, speakers and attendees. Now if I can remember how to stop the presentation, we'll be good. Thank you all very much.